Hello, this is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. We are live streaming from beautiful downtown Sunnyvale in California, very close to Apple computer and all the tech people around here in Silicon Valley. Uh, as you all know, spring training is starting up in baseball and baseball is one of our favorite subjects because of the interesting coincidence of thoracic outlet syndrome that's now being recognized more widely. So we hope to have some new information on our website and some live streams coming up on that topic, including we'll have Dr. Vernon Williams soon, who speaks about very elite athletes. We've had him on before. He's a wonderful speaker, very smart guy. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. But before we do, I want to remind you all, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Hit the little bell so that you can automatically have our live streams sent to you and new videos sent to you. And please hit the like button. Get your friends to hit the like button. We count on our subscribers and it really helps the algorithm so that we can spread our message of thoracic outlet syndrome to as many future patients and families and care providers as possible. Now, today we're going to talk about a totally unrelated subject, appendicitis. But in fact, it's not totally unrelated. I will tell you, I'm a big fan of the history of medicine because with 100 years or 50 years or 200 years of perspective, sometimes you realize steps that were taken in the right direction and missteps. And it's really fascinating to me to learn how concepts developed, especially when people didn't have the tools that we have now. So we're all building on the shoulders of giants before us. And that's why I find history of medicine fascinating. So I'm going to start in talking about appendicitis. Appendicitis as a model for thoracic outlet syndrome. The history of appendicitis and the history of thoracic outlet syndrome occurred over somewhat similar time frames, but they had different personalities, different concepts, different challenges, and different successes. I think you'll find some interesting parallels. If we study the history of appendicitis, we'll understand a little better how we can study thoracic outlet syndrome better in the future. Now, here's a couple of comments. This was a presidential address to the Southern Surgical Society or Southern Surgical Association, uh, published in 1983, although the address was made to this crowd in 1982. And if you read this, it basically says, when we look at history, remembering the dates, the names, the places are of little value unless something is learned by the process by which we make progress in medicine. And he goes on to talk about the history of appendicitis, including examples of resistance to changing concepts. This is something Thomas Kuhn has talked about in the paradigm shift. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to read through this if you'd like. So I think what this points out is that we're all involved in a logical world, but we're all humans. So sometimes we get biases and dogma. Natalie Brooks wrote an interesting online article, Appendicitis at 100. And I don't know where she got 100 from because, as you'll see, the history of appendicitis is not a, a distinct starting point. It's kind of gray. We're going to learn some interesting stuff. But she said, the appendix and its inflammation took thousands of years to be understood. I would say, not just understood, but even just recognized. Coptic jars in which Egyptian mummies' intestines were placed sometimes carried an inscription referring to the worm of the bowel, and that would be the appendix, even though they didn't know what it was at the time and it wasn't named. We believe that there was some evidence that people understood the appendix was there. So let's go back to some of the first real evidence we have. 150 AD, Galen who was the son of a wealthy Greek architect. He rose quite quickly through the field of health, medicine, and surgery and became the personal physician to several emperors. So he was in quite a good position to study medicine. He had access to the best libraries. He could dissect cadavers theoretically. And he is still to this day one of the widely respected early medical authorities and researchers. But let's keep in mind that even though People like Galen had access to human cadavers, theoretically, really it was frowned upon. And so he would occasionally get an executed criminal's body to study, but more often than not to continue his research, he would use animals, Barbary apes in particular. So while he studied some human anatomy, 
he made a lot of claims that were widely accepted for over a thousand years, almost 1500 years. But he also made some mistakes as we're gonna learn about. In 1492, Leonardo da Vinci actually did make a drawing that included the appendix. Even though there's no written description by him, and even though it was only published in the 18th century, you'll be able to see down here in the right lower corner of your screen, a picture of the cecum and the small bow and that blind ending tube, which is the appendix. In 1522, this is 1500 years after Galen, and that's with 1500 years of solidified, Galen is the smartest man in medicine type of knowledge. It was hard to go against this kind of dogma. But this fellow, Jacopo Berengario de Carpi, who was a professor of surgery, he came up with a novel technique where he copied somebody else with it to inject fluid into blood vessels and the bowel and other hollow structures for autopsy, meaning he recognized that after death, the body parts would collapse without blood pressure and they would dry out if they weren't filled with food. So he injected fluid into body parts and he described the appendix. Now we're going to go to, I'm sorry, Vesalius, who I'm missing a slide here, bear with me. Okay, Andre Vesalius in uh, 1500s was another one of those superstars that rose quickly through the ranks, became widely known for his incredibly detailed anatomic drawings. Immediately upon graduating medical school, he became a chair of surgery and anatomy at the University of Padua. And in 1543, the thing he's most famous for is this seven volume, the human body fabric, once you translate it into English. He was an imperial physician to the court of Emperor Charles V, and he actually did get to dissect humans. He made these beautiful drawings. And in this one, in 1543, you can actually see the appendix. You see a string is tied around the distal small bowel. So this shows mostly the colon, but it does include the appendix. All right. So people started recognizing that the appendix existed, but they only started for many, many years, for hundreds of years. There are many people who refused to accept the existence of the appendix because Galen, this tremendous authority, had never shown it. So in 1711, this doctor, Lorenz Heister, documented the first unequivocal description of an inflamed appendix with perforation on autopsy. In 1711, he did a dissection of an executed criminal, and he found that the appendix was blackened and necrotic, meaning it was dying, and there were small perforations. He also found that when he just tried to free up the appendix to look at it, that it spilled out a couple of teaspoonfuls of probably pus into the peritoneal cavity. And that would have, in a live person, of course, caused severe infection, for which they had no treatment at the time. Now, as you notice, this wasn't published until 1754. In 1759, Mestivier, a surgeon in Paris, described a right lower quadrant abscess. Now, at the time, because surgery had some risks to it, doctors would find an abscess in the abdomen and they would wait for it to quote unquote point. It would come to the surface of the skin, usually the anterior abdominal wall. And at that point, they could decide whether to make a little cut and let it release all this purulent fluid, all this infection. Now, of course, that's pretty late in the course of a disease by the time it gets to the abdominal wall. And so patients didn't do so well, but weighing it against the risks of surgery, it might've been the best they could hope for. And in 1759, what Mestivier discovered was that there was a pin in the appendix when he did this autopsy. So presumably patients swallowed a pin, it perforated the appendix and it led to this infection. In 1812, John Parkinson found on an autopsy of a five-year-old boy that the boy had a normal cecum, that's the proximal end of the colon where the appendix attaches but he had appendicolis or stones in an inflamed appendix. John Parkinson actually went on to study the Parkinson's disease that we know of today. Another Frenchman, Francois Melier, I hope I pronounced it right, described six more cases of appendicitis at autopsy. And he was the first that we know of 
to suggest surgical removal of the appendix. That was in 1827. That was a bold statement at the time, but people got appendicitis fairly frequently and at least two thirds of them died from it. Now his paper was largely ignored because of this person, Guillaume de Petrin. De Petrin's Contractures is a famous uh, medical student uh, knowledge tester. And actually de Petrin has several things named after him. He, as you see in this picture here, looks very regal, very aristocratic. He was a baron. He was born in 1777. He was famous throughout France. He had a huge medical practice. Some people believe he may have had 10,000 people, patients that he saw regularly. He became the richest doctor of his time and was very influential. Today, as I said, there are multiple syndromes and conditions with de Petrin's name attached. However, people have said that he wasn't the most pleasant person to work with. You can read a couple of quotes here. I find the second one fascinating, that his incorrect opinions were supported by the same weight of authority as his correct ones. So this is what might be called an appeal to authority. I'm an expert on A, so when I say something about B, it must be true. And we have to be careful about that, all of us. Here's a couple more quotes. These are specifically about appendicitis. Now, de Petrin did not believe in the existence of the appendix from what we can tell. He thought that all this inflammation arose from the cecum. And that's why he argued with people such as Melois, who published a series of papers and suggested early surgical treatment. The statement at the bottom that he may have retarded the recognition of appendicitis for years is unfortunate for all those people in between who suffered from it. So we have this skepticism about the disease process, and for some people, skepticism about the existence of the appendix. We have an uncertain and difficult diagnosis. Even to this day, it's challenging to diagnose appendicitis clinically. And then surgery at the time carried many risks. It wasn't until the 1870s and 1880s that we finally started seeing some progress in antisepsis from Robert Lister. Uh, in blood transfusion, because people would lose blood during surgery, in anesthesia, so people could undergo surgery. And this fellow came along, Reginald H. Fitz. He came from a family that was traced back nine generations to Plymouth Rock, I believe, highly educated man. And in 1886, while he was a professor at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, the first meeting of the Association of American Physicians was held in Washington, D.C. And for this distinguished audience, Dr. Fitz had prepared a paper. Now, what he had done in this paper <coughs> was he had taken the clinical records and then the pathology of 250 patients who had died with perforated appendicitis. And he really nailed it down, that all these symptoms coming from different spots and all these signs that the patients had on examination all related to a perforated appendicitis. And most patients at that time would eventually perforate because very few people, if any, did surgery. Fitz then said, just as Melois had said previously, surgical removal of the appendix early was the best choice. Now, there was a lot of resistance to that. I'm going to talk briefly about who performed the first appendectomy. I want you to keep in mind that early on, physicians would only find an abscess in the right lower quadrant. They didn't have any imaging. They couldn't tell specifically that it came from the appendix. Then there were docs who, besides treating the abscess, there were other docs who did do an appendectomy, but it was coincidental or accidental. They had diagnosed something else and gone in surgically. Then you have the people who accurately diagnosed appendicitis and intentionally went in to treat appendicitis. And those could be perforated or non-perforated. Of course, perforated appendicitis is later in the course of the disease, and you'd prefer to get in there earlier, but it's harder. So 1731, William Cooksley uh, was doing a hernia repair. And uh, many years later, somebody had 
taken the autopsy results of this patient and found that the cecum and the appendix had been partially removed. So Cooksley didn't even know he had performed an appendectomy. In 1735, probably the first real appendectomy, Claudius Amiand, who still has some things named after him, he operated on an 11-year-old boy who had had a chronic hernia in the scrotum, and then he developed a fistula from the colon to the skin surface. So stool was coming out through the skin surface through a small fistula. And Amiand went in, operated on this, and turns out he had to remove the appendix as part of this process. Again, he did not go in knowing the appendix was there or that it was the cause of the disease or that he had any intent of removing it. Mistivier in 1759, he actually intentionally took a right lower quadrant abscess. That means there's fluid and pus and infection filling the right lower quadrant of the abdomen, and it was coming to the skin surface. And he intentionally opened it. He said, from now on, when someone has a right lower quadrant abscess, I'm going to drain it as soon as possible. Again, he didn't know that it came from the appendix, and he didn't go in surgically to remove the appendix. He just wanted to release the pressure from this abscess. In 1848, almost 100 years later, a Hancock was the first to perform a deliberate laparotomy or surgery for this abscess in the right lower quadrant. It was periappendiceal, meaning around the appendix, but he had not diagnosed appendicitis. He just knew there was an abscess there, and he was not going to wait for it to get to this pointing stage in the abdominal wall he was going to go in earlier. In 1856, not much later, Lewis published 40 very similar cases, so they were getting more aggressive about getting to these abscesses before the abscess got really big. And in 1867, Willard Parker had much better success at these, and that was probably due to the fact that antisepsis was improving, meaning that infection was controlled better. Now, Robert Lister, I'm going to take a short break here. Robert Lister, was it Robert or Joseph Lister, um, was a, a British surgeon and highly regarded, and he's the guy who first figured out that bacteria and germs could cause post-surgical infection and, of course, increase surgical mortality. But it took him a couple of decades to get people to recognize this quantum shift. And so you wonder how many patients suffered in the meantime because they didn't get treated for any kind of infection. Nowadays, of course, we all take that for granted. For even the lightest procedure, we get alcohol wipes and we're careful about infection. 1887, this is a turning point. Thomas Morton, who is a respected surgeon in Philadelphia, he diagnosed perforated appendicitis and he removed the appendix and the patient survived. And less than a year later, the same Dr. Morton diagnosed a non-perforated appendicitis, meaning likely earlier in the course, and he successfully removed the appendix. Sadly, both his brother and one of his sons died of appendicitis. It's, the world is a funny place. But Thomas Morton is the one who is recognized as first doing an appendectomy for a specific diagnosis of appendicitis. Now, just some interesting side notes. Harry Houdini, the famous escape artist and magician, he died of appendicitis and peritonitis. That's infection of the lining of the abdomen in 1926. We were already into the age of um, appendectomy, but I believe that he refused to have that done. The next three doctors, doctors Cushing, Halstead, and Osler, would be known to some doctors who might be listening. Dr. Harvey Cushing trained at Johns Hopkins. He became a pioneer in brain surgery, very famous doctor. William Halstead was the father of modern American surgery, and he sent many of his residents out into other parts of the United States to start their own surgery departments. And William Osler is called the father of modern medicine. He was an internist. He created all kinds of methods for teaching medical students how to learn medicine. And they were all at Hopkins. Well, Dr. Cushing in 1887, I believe, uh, had to do surgery on a patient who had appendicitis and the patient passed away. And then two weeks later, he started getting symptoms of appendicitis. So he consulted these other two giants in the field. Eventually, they decided he needed surgery and he did undergo surgery. He had a bit of a complicated course, but he survived and he did have appendicitis. And then King Edward VII, pardon the typo, King Edward VII uh, was, I believe, 59 years old before he ever got a whiff of the crown because apparently he wasn't really up to the job. 
but um, his mother, the queen, died, and coronation was planned, and it takes several weeks because it's just a huge gala celebration. Well, it turns out during that time, he developed abdominal pain, which was likely appendicitis, and he went up and down, better and worse, but eventually he just said, the heck with it, I'm going to the coronation on time. And one of his doctors, Dr. Treves, who became famous, he said, you can go, but you're going to go as a corpse if we don't do this surgery. So he did have surgery and he did survive and he ruled for eight years, I believe. Okay, so let's go skip to the modern diagnosis of appendicitis. <clears throat> I've mentioned this study before, but Rao et al. in 1997 wrote this paper. And before this paper was published, we surgeons had gotten pretty good at diagnosing appendicitis, but there was still an error rate. There was 15% false positives, meaning you thought the patient had appendicitis, but when you went in surgically, that was not so. And there were 15% false negatives, meaning you did not believe the patient had appendicitis, but it turns out they did. And so we were missing a decent amount of people with a serious disease. After Rao, we have knocked that number down to about 3%, so a significant, significant improvement. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of images. This is a CAT scan, the right lower quadrant. You see this little tiny hole. This is cutting through the middle of the appendix. There's a very thin wall. Around it is beautiful dark gray fat, and there's gas within the lumen. This is another picture in the transverse plane, but you can see an appendix wandering into the pelvis alongside the urinary bladder and the uterus probably. And this is a normal appendix. Now this is an abnormal appendix. Here we're showing a stone, an appendicolith. And if you look behind the stone, you see this gray poorly defined material that's fluid and inflammation. This is probably perforated appendicitis. But again, you could see how a CT scan shows everything beautifully here that you would need to know as a surgeon. It confirms the diagnosis and it shows the location of the appendix as well as the location of any fluid or abscess. Now look at this one. The appendix is right up alongside the edge of the liver, not down in the right lower quadrant. It's up just about under the rib cage. And here's another one, a subhepatic appendix, beautiful picture winding up underneath the liver towards the midline above the kidney. Well, if this one gets inflamed, it's gonna look like this. It's got a little bit of gray fluid around it. The wall is very thickened. If you're a surgeon, you're examining this patient, you're thinking pancreatitis, gallbladder disease, kidney disease, hepatic disease, liver disease, but you're not thinking appendicitis because it's not down in the right lower quadrant. It's another one. You can see the appendix is not even on the right side. It's now over on the left side in the pelvis. If this gets inflamed, how are you going to know on physical examination that this is appendicitis? So you can see some of these cases will prove that by itself, the clinical exam isn't great. Here's another one tucked way up under the liver, right next to the gallbladder. And here's one that's in the middle, very superficial instead of deep. It's very close to the anterior abdominal wall. One more example, way over on the left side. Here's one on the left side. So what I intend to show with these images is how variable the appendix can be in location and length and how difficult this might make a diagnosis because when you're palpating the abdomen, when you're looking for signs and symptoms, you're in the wrong place. So let's go and jump ahead to thoracic outlet syndrome. The most important paper to emphasize today's point was written by this fellow, Pete, Robert Pete. He hadn't finished his training. He was a fellow in neurology. And way back in 1956, he wrote this article. This was physical therapy for patients with this syndrome. But interestingly, let's read a few things he said. So I think we all agree with this in our modern understanding. It's neurovascular symptoms, it involves the upper extremity, and it's caused by mechanical changes with narrowing of those spaces in the thoracic outlet. So a little longer to read, I'll give you a little bit longer. <clears throat> 
So in this paragraph, Pete describes multiple names, and I've collected a bunch of these on our website. I think I came up with 27 different names from the medical literature, like cervical rib syndrome, scalenus anticus syndrome, and many others. Now, they do have a similar symptom pattern, but not identical. And they do come from the same mechanism of stretching or compression. And he also mentions the subclavian artery and vein. So he's starting to point out how complex this condition can be. And then he says they might be grouped together and referred to as the thoracic outlet syndrome. And this is the first mention of that term, thoracic outlet syndrome. But he grouped them all together even after he just described how different they can be. And then this paragraph for me nails it down. So in this paragraph, he's talking about all the anatomic variations that are possible and all the different causes. The etiologic aspects is a fancy medical term, but that's the different causes. Okay, There are numerous explanations of the underlying pathology, and yet in the paragraph just before, he said, let's group it all together. This, for me, was a turning point that's made it more challenging since then to actually go back to where we were understanding the different syndromes better. I brought this up before. In 1990, for a while, back and forth in the literature, Asa Wilborn and David Roos had a very healthy discussion, let's say. Asa Wilborn was a neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and he was the primary force for developing the term disputed neurogenic TOS. And he based it on who had positive findings of EMG or nerve conduction velocity and who didn't have those abnormal findings as well as did the patients have atrophy of their hand muscles. Now, we've talked about this on our YouTube channel before on our live streams. By the time you get atrophy of your hand muscles, it's late in the course of that disease, and you don't want to get there. With no nerve entrapment, does your doctor want you to develop muscle atrophy? You want to treat it first before the larger, more strong and protected motor nerve fibers are involved. Once those large motor nerve fibers are involved, you get muscle atrophy, and then it's very hard to recover. David Roos was a surgeon in Denver, Colorado, who did studies in his surgical patients, as well as in cadavers, finding all these bands, fibrous tissue, abnormalities of the lung apex, extra muscles in the thoracic outlet. And he postulated that those extra things contributed to these nerve entrapments. So these two doctors went back and forth with their discussions, and I think most people know which side I fall on. We do know from many, many papers that there are a number of anatomic variations. We do know that EMG nerve velocity studies are not sensitive for this, and besides, they don't provide anatomic information. And we know that when you have a nerve entrapment, like thoracic outlet syndrome, we should be treated before we get atrophy of the hand. All right, so I'm going to skip back a little bit. Is there something we can still learn about the appendix? And I found this fascinating. For many years, doctors would say, just if you're going in, you can remove the appendix too because it doesn't do anything. They would point out that the appendix is only seen in certain higher level primates, not Barbary apes, as Galen mistakenly thought. But um, since the appendix only exists as this independent structure in a few animals, People have for years presumed that it's just a remnant, it's disappearing with evolution. But that's not true. Here's another opinion. Lymphoid tissue is the lymph nodes, they fight infection, they collect bacteria, and they help uh, maintain the immune system. So this person said the lymphoid tissue is the characteristic feature of the apex of the cecum. The vermiform appendix, pardon the French here, of man is represented in the vertebrate kingdom by just a mass of lymphoid tissue around the cecum, but without a discrete separate structure. As the vertebrate scale is ascended, as you get more complex advanced vertebrates like us, this lymphoid tissue tends to be collected together in a differentiated portion called the appendix. And then he said, it is not therefore a vestigial structure. On the contrary, it's a specialized part of the bowel 
nature making use of a disappearing structure in other animals and endowing it with a secondary function by giving it lymphoid tissue to protect the body against the microorganisms in this region. And this was, guess it, what year it was? 1913. I just found this paper today and it was fascinating that this person, I've never heard of before, actually thought so far ahead and he didn't take it for granted that the appendix was vestigial, but he thought it clearly had a function. Now, today we study a lot more about the gut bacteria, and some people believe the appendix stores gut bacteria to keep us healthy. Now, is there something we can still learn about TOS? I don't think I need to ask our viewers to raise their hands. Here are some things we do know about TOS. There are multiple mechanisms. We understand a lot of them, but there are probably some more we don't fully understand, like pectoralis minor syndrome. There are a lot of anatomic variants in the thoracic outlet. No argument about this. There are modern diagnostic tools that we have, certainly better than the people who have written about appendicitis, but each of these has their strengths and weaknesses. And if we look at appendicitis and draw a parallel, certainly CT scan had been well-developed before 1997, but when Rao applied this tool to this particular disease, he really hit a bonanza and he's really improved through that first paper, the specificity and sensitivity and accuracy of diagnosing appendicitis. And then the last point, we do have multiple surgical modalities like endoscopic, robotic, different approaches, whether it's supraclavicular or infraclavicular, and we can know more about these things. So I'm going to take the presentation down. And at this point, we're going to be willing to accept and hopefully help with questions. Christoph, how are you? He says, hi, Dr. Worden. Thank you for your live stream. You are most welcome. We're always glad to see you here. My question is, is there any imaging method that allows us to see scar tissue pre-op and post-op? So that is a complex question, but I will boil it down to this. Scar tissue uh, goes through several phases. If we start before surgery and we're assuming uh, kind of a chronic scar tissue, that will show up on almost every MRI sequence as dark or hypo-intense, usually dark gray and black. And when you administer contrast material, you won't see any change. But we can only see it to a certain resolution. So while there is now evidence developing that within the nerves, you get this tiny fibrosis developing, and that can create symptoms and make it harder to treat. We do not have the resolution to see that with an MRI. Now, it gets more complex. Thank you to your question. When you do a post-op study, if it's within a certain amount of time, and I'm guessing within a year or so, because there's no solid literature on this, we can see the same dark or hypo-intense tissue in the surgical bed. And when we give contrast material gadolinium, then we can see that it will enhance or light up to a certain amount. So we can compare pre and post contrast administration images and see what's happening. And I do see this in some of the post-op patients that we get, that some develop more or less scar tissue, can also be called surgical granulation tissue. And we can also see it around the nerve roots that they develop a bit of scarring or fibrosis or granulation tissue if the patient has had what's called a neurolysis. So I hope that at least partially answers your question. Thank you, Christoph. Hi, Marcus. How can I get the Nia Vista near me and find out if my surgeon is on your recommended list? Well, uh, thank you for the question. If you come to our website, which we'll put up on here, it's tosmri.com, and there's a button that says Contact Us, or you can read on our webpage about Nia Vista. That menu has one page that includes a lot of information as well as where you can get our study. But we're glad to help you with that. And in terms of recommended physicians, we don't, you know, recommend or de-recommend doctors. We try to provide doctors that have experience because we believe that experience makes the biggest difference in successful diagnosis and treatment. And because there are so many different treatment modalities and there's still a good amount that's unsettled about the best approach, uh, we do recommend seeing more than one doctor if you need to. Um, Certainly before surgery, getting a second consult or even a third 
works for many patients because then they feel very solidified in making the best judgment. So we're here to help, not just in this, but other resources. If you want to read more about TOS, we're glad to point you the right way. We do consultations where we answer your questions um, individually and in general. So don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll provide you the resources so you can learn and make the best decision for yourself. Hi, Angela. I love your content. You are so nice. Thank you. It's good to see you here again. Tate, thank you. So glad for these talks, Dr. Warden. Thank you. We thank you for following us, subscribing, and get your friends and all the patients you know with TOS to help share in the community. Tate says, are there any diagnostic tests that would be important to get regularly to monitor the progression of TOS? Particularly if you have venous TOS, should the condition of the subclavian vein be monitored? That is a very interesting question. And I'll say it this way. Most patients with true venous TOS that have a blood clot, there's, there's another syndrome that people get with no blood clot, but let's assume that the well-known, widely recognized venous TOS. If you have a blood clot, it's not a small thing. Your arm will swell up. It'll feel heavy. It might turn blue or purple, and you'll see extra new veins forming over the chest wall. So it's generally a pretty dramatic presentation. And I would say if you're symptom-free, that you don't need follow-up. Remember that some radiology tests like CAT scans administer radiation, so you don't want to do that just on a whim. MRI does not administer any radiation, and that's good. There's a cost to doing it, of course. You have to pay for the study. And you need to make sure it's done by somebody who recognizes the disease, otherwise it's a bit wasted. And then ultrasound can be very helpful. That has no radiation. It's less expensive. You can do it in many arm positions. So overall, I would say if you don't have symptoms, just have your doctor examine you once a year. And then when you do arm maneuvers, do you develop any symptoms or swelling or limited drainage of the veins in certain arm positions? That's where a doctor can help you. And if you do get a test, I think ultrasound in that situation is a great test to have to follow up. So if you have further questions, reach out to us. We're glad to answer them more specifically. And that's a really good question. Thank you. Tate, <coughs> excuse me. Well, I think we just answered it. If your symptoms don't change, I don't think you need to get more diagnostic tests. Tate uh, gives us further information. I had a blood clot a long time ago, but never had any surgery. My symptoms are now more neurogenic TOS than venous TOS. So I guess collaterals are my friends. Well, that's a neat way to put it. Uh, if you have collaterals, you can form acute collaterals, but more often than not, if you really see them, it's chronic because your body takes a while to build the new veins, especially since they're under low pressure. And that can imply that you do have a narrowing, a stenosis, scarring of one of the dominant veins like the axillary vein leading into the subclavian vein. So if that's never been diagnosed, uh, it might be worth evaluating that. An ultrasound is a good screening test, but then, of course, an MRI and MR angiogram and MR venogram, if done properly, can provide more anatomic information about whether you have narrowing, and if so, what outside the vein is causing the narrowing. Remember that the veins can get an intrinsic problem built into the vein with nothing on the outside compressing it, or the veins can be constantly under pressure because of these extrinsic structures and develop the stenosis or scar because of that. So it is important to see both inside the vein and outside the vein and in multiple arm positions because we know that is the mechanism of TOS. Now, whether you have neurogenic TOS, that would be usually a different kind of symptoms. And if your doc suspects that uh, he or she can refer you to us, we can do a consultation. I think it takes more detail than uh, we want to go into here. And besides, for your privacy, for everybody's privacy, we don't discuss specific medical cases, just generalities. So please reach out to us. Those are all really good questions, and I hope they're helpful to everybody. Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Are there any imaging studies that will definitively show scar tissue that may have developed status post-first rib resection and scalenectomy? Yes. I think that we do a good job here looking at post-op patients. It is complex um, because a lot of surgeons take different approaches um, and because it's there's a lot of scar tissue that can form 
in some patients, you need somebody who's seen a lot of these studies, and we have, um, not just tuning our own horn, but we really try to help. And for our prior question uh, from Christoph about seeing scarring, yes, we have to take a couple extra steps to see the scarring, but I think we're the best equipped to really assess how much is there and how much it's affecting the nerves and contributing to persistent symptoms. Again, um, consultation with us would probably help, and hopefully you have records of your prior scans or maybe the images from the prior scans, because comparing them would be very helpful pre-op and post-op. And by the way, that's a little public service message. If any of you get our scans, we always encourage you to keep the images on a disc from the imaging center that does them. And if you get imaging elsewhere, like a cervical spine MRI or a shoulder MRI or a chest MRA, uh, ask for the images on a CD. It costs the center almost nothing to do that. Then keep a copy of the report on your computer and you can store the images on your computer too. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Ah, you're welcome. All right, going to see if I have other questions here. So uh, thank you very much for staying with us. And we hope this provides some very interesting information and helps with your paradigm and understanding of thoracic outlet syndrome. Again, we want to ask you to subscribe to us and hit the bell to keep us regularly in your queue. Hit the like button because that algorithm really pays attention to us if we got people that are participating. Thank you all for your questions. We, we truly appreciate the chance to help. You can reach us at www tosmri.com. I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy, and we'll see you next time.